that Jesus performed that is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Only one of Jesus' miracles is recorded in all four of the Gospels. It's the feeding of the 5,000 as we have come to know it. It's an important miracle. And it's placed in an important point in Luke's gospel. Uh, it's a crucial moment in Luke's gospel. As we were thinking uh, last week, uh, Luke chapter 9 is a transition in Luke's gospel. Uh, uh, after Luke chapter 9, there are very few miracles of Jesus recorded. It's his teaching and his parables and his death that become the focus. But here, I think it's important to remember that Luke isn't just a random collection uh, of uh, events uh, cobbled together uh, by uh, uh, Luke. He tells us that in Luke chapter 1, verse 3, he's writing an orderly account. Luke has chosen the order of things for a reason. I don't know if you notice in our reading that the feeding of the 5,000 comes right between Herod's uncertainty uh, there in verse 9, Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? It comes then between Herod's uncertainty and the disciples' certainty. Jesus says in verse 20, who do you say I am? Peter said, the Christ of God. Herod doesn't know who Jesus is. Peter does. And this miracle comes right between the two. I think it's a miracle that underlines and concludes the evidence it's the climax of the evidence regarding who Jesus is that's what Alfred Eldersheim says this miracle and what follows mark the climax of our Lord's doings uh, and it's his doings that is the evidence for who he is it is the final piece of evidence regarding the identity of Jesus. So Jesus meets the needs of thousands here in Luke chapter 9 verses 10 to 17. Notice then first of all that Jesus gives up his privacy. Jesus gives up his privacy. Verses 9, uh, 10 and 11. Sorry, verses 10 and 11. At verse 10, when the apostles returned from their mission trip, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. The ESV says they withdrew apart. The Christian Standard Bible says they withdrew privately. Uh, J.B. Phillips in his translation brings out the uh, sense of the words. He, he says... He, uh, Jesus took them with him privately and retired into a town called Bethsaida. The uh, contemporary English version, he took them with him to Bethsaida where they could be alone. That's what's happening here. Jesus is taking his disciples apart, privately, withdrawing, alone, away from the crowd. The uh, uh, other Gospels give us uh, the reasons for this. In Matthew chapter 14, where this miracle is recorded, the news comes of the death of John the Baptist. Uh, John's disciples, it says in Matthew 14, verse 12, John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Grief. One reason that he withdrew was to be alone uh, following that, the death of John, uh, his forerunner. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, yes, that's how some people deal with grief, to be alone. Jesus withdrew uh, at this time of grief. In uh, Mark's gospel, uh, we're told the apostles, this is in Mark chapter 6, verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. 
I think there are two reasons for this privacy. Grief over the death of John the Baptist, and also because the things were so busy and hectic and uh, uh, harassed, uh, uh, the intrusion of the crowd on Jesus and his disciples. We need to get away from the crowd, avoid this intrusion. We haven't even got time to eat. Let's go away quietly, privately, by ourselves. But the crowd discovers uh, what has happened, verse 11. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. They followed on foot. Jesus went by boat, as we saw there in Matthew's uh, gospel. Uh, and uh, the first uh, uh, of the crowd uh, arrived before he lands. In Matthew's gospel, as he lands, he sees the crowd gathered there. Uh, and the crowd uh, quickly grows uh, to thousands. What is uh, Jesus's reaction? His private retirement is intruded upon by the crowds. The very thing he was trying to avoid. <laughs> the crowds were coming and going. They had no time to eat. Let's get away from this intrusion. And now the crowds come and intrude again. How would you feel if your downtime, your me time, your holiday, your day off was intruded. Uh, uh, people rang you up and people asked you to come and work when it's your day off or when it's your holiday. Wouldn't, we wouldn't be very pleased with that, would we? Was uh, Jesus uh, frustrated uh, with the crowd? Was he exasperated by them? Did he tell them, rebuke them and tell them to leave? No. Halfway through verse 11, he welcomed them even though jesus had tried to withdraw from them he welcomed them when they came no exasperation no rebuke he welcomed them and we know why he welcomed them because mark tells us in his account uh, uh, in mark chapter 6 verse 34 when jesus landed and saw a large crowd he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Uh, we know that we were thinking on Thursday, that, that word compassion means that Jesus had a gut-wrenching experience. His innards were uh, disturbed by it. His heart went out to them. He had compassion on them. And what did he do? Well, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God, the blessings of belonging to God's kingdom, the uh, blessings of being under God's kingship. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God and cured those who needed healing. You see, for Jesus, the needs of others was always his priority. Those who are doing the sheet, the needs of others was always or were always his priority. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life. He gives his time. He gives his privacy up. He gave his life at the cross eventually for many. Jesus gives up his privacy to meet the needs of the crowd, the needs to know the blessings of God's kingdom, the needs for healing of uh, diseases and illnesses. Uh, Jesus gives up his privacy for the needs of others. But then Jesus gives a puzzle to the 12. The, uh, Jesus gives the 12 a puzzle. Uh, in verses 12 and 13. Uh, the puzzle uh, comes at the beginning of verse 13. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. I think Jesus had introduced this puzzle uh, to Philip earlier in the day. In John's account, in John chapter 6 uh, and uh, verse 5, Jesus has crossed the Sea of Galilee. It says in John 6 verse 5, when Jesus looked up, and saw a great crowd coming towards him, 
he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? So the puzzle had been set at the beginning of the day and uh, uh, Philip had wondered about it. I think Philip had gone to the other disciples and got their uh, help. Uh, Julie has got a word puzzle that she does uh, uh, occasionally. And sometimes she said, can you come and help find this word for me? I can't get this one word in the puzzle. Uh, so I'll go along and uh, I'm reading words all day uh, and I can find the word. Well, Philip, I think Philip asked the other disciples, what's the, what's the solution to this puzzle? Jesus wants us to feed, well, he, Jesus has asked about feeding this great crowd. Well, uh, as Jesus teaches and heals, perhaps the uh, disciples discuss with each other and try to uh, work out the solution. Well, their answer uh, at the end of the day is given in verse 12. Late in the afternoon, the 12 came to him and said, send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place. What's their solution? Send the crowd away so they can get food for themselves. That's the only solution we can see to this puzzle. You've got to send them away to get food for themselves. It's too big a crowd. Uh, uh, we're in a remote place. Send them away uh, to get food for themselves. Well, uh, for Jesus, that's not the solution. The test question that was set for Philip is now addressed to all the disciples, but not now as a question, but as a demand. Verse 13, you give them something to eat. And the, the you is emphatic. You yourselves give them something. The solution isn't to send them away. The solution is for you to give them something to eat. Yeah. For the disciples, our supply of five loaves of bread and two fish isn't sufficient. Our resources are totally inadequate. And buying food for a crowd consisting of 5,000 males, and that's literally what it says in verse 14, about 5,000 males. Uh, Luke, uh, Matthew tells us that that's not counting women and children. Uh, buying food for a crowd of 5,000 males plus women and children in this area is not, it's beyond our ability. We can't do it. Jesus, what are you asking? It's beyond our ability. It's beyond our resources. We can't do it. Well, actually, they do do it. Notice there in verse 16, later on, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. The disciples did give them food. See, they hadn't factored Jesus into the puzzle. <laughs> they hadn't factored Jesus into the puzzle. They should have. And I think I think Luke is giving us the hint there because back in verse one, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and cure diseases. And it's Luke who tells us in verse 12, late in the afternoon, the 12 came to him. It's the same ones. It's the same ones who Jesus had given power to. And Jesus himself has shown his power, hasn't he, when he welcomed that crowd at the end of verse 11, and healed those who needed healing. These uh, uh, should know that Jesus had power that he could give to them to supply this problem, this puzzle. But humanly speaking, there was no solution apart from sending them away. They only thought of their own ability. They only thought of their own ability. Those doing the sheet, it's their ability that they only thought of their own resources, not what Jesus could do through them. They only thought of their own ability, and that's why they said there's no solution, send them away. Jesus gives the 12 a puzzle, and they don't solve it. 
so uh, uh, we've seen that Jesus gives up his privacy. Jesus gives the 12 a puzzle. And then thirdly, Jesus gives the crowd plenty. Jesus gives the crowd plenty. Uh, Jesus uh, tells the disciples, make them sit down in groups of about 50 each. Uh, there to uh, make the crowd sit down in uh, dinner parties. That's really what that word group uh, uh, indicates. Uh, little uh, dinner parties of about 50 uh, uh, each. Because things will be done orderly and safely. Uh, otherwise, there might have been a thrush uh, if uh, people were asked to come and collect. But no, make them sit down in groups of 50. That things will be done orderly and safely. And it's interesting, isn't it? We're told, verse uh, 15, the disciples did so. Now, that's an act of faith on the part of the disciples because there's no food yet. We're going to sit down in dinner parties. Come on, sit down in a dinner party of 50 here, dinner party in there. Sit down and get ready for dinner. Mm. <laughs> but they, they believe that Jesus has got the solution. Jesus takes the loaves and fish uh, and looks up to heaven. Uh, he wants to make sure the whole crowd uh, uh, understand that he is acknowledging God's provision. Uh, they might not all be able to hear him, but they can all see that Jesus looks up to heaven as he takes the, uh, the bread and the fish. Uh, he's acknowledging uh, God's provision. He uh, gave thanks uh, or, or blessed uh, the bread and the fish, broke them and gave to his disciples who distributed uh, amongst the crowd. And then very simply, verse 17, they all ate and were satisfied. Now, simply this miracle is described. They all ate and were satisfied. And not only that, the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Thousands fed full from five loaves and two fish. The details of the mechanics of the miracle uh, are not uh, given. I think uh, Archbishop Trench is right when he said it is true wisdom to leave the indescribable undescribed. It was in Jesus' hands that the miracle happened as he distributed, broke and distributed and, and, and carried on doing so and doing so and doing so. But the miracle was done. It was a miracle. Again, J.C. Ryle says, deception is impossible. 5,000 hungry men, besides women and children, received real food that satisfied them. 12 baskets would never have been taken up if real material loaves had not been multiplied. Nothing, in short, can explain the whole transaction but the finger of God. Jesus gives the crowd plenty and provides for their needs uh, uh, in a way that the disciples uh, couldn't begin to solve themselves. Jesus uh, gives the crowd plenty and meets their needs. And again, Luke has placed this here uh, because it's revealing something about Jesus. It's uh, the final piece in the puzzle about the identity of Jesus. The great uh, African uh, church father Augustine says, all the acts of Jesus are not as pictures merely to look at and admire, but as letters which we must learn to read and understand. It is telling us something about Jesus. What's it telling us? Well, Jesus can more than supply the needs of everyone who comes to him. Jesus can more than supply the needs of everyone who comes to him. Archbishop Trent, what is it a bit 
more flowery than that. He says, the unexhausted and inexhaustible upholder of all life in whom there is enough and to spare for the spiritual needs of all hungering souls in all ages. Will you come to Jesus with your need? Don't know what your needs are this morning. Some of you are strangers. Uh, I don't know all everything all, about all of you. But Jesus can more than supply all your needs. The needs, as we were thinking earlier, for the removal of the consequences of our sin. The need for a, a home that it's a, Jesus can supply uh, those needs. Will you come to Jesus with your needs today, if you haven't yet done so? Finding him the great supplier. And it is a lesson for disciples of Jesus. Factor Jesus into seemingly impossible situations. Factor Jesus into seemingly impossible situations. That applies doesn't it, to our life as a church at the moment. We've got, to, we've got to factor Jesus into the situation and what he can do, yes, through us, and yet what he can do with his power to supply the need. I think having seen this miracle, Peter, as spokesman for the other disciples, when asked, who do you say? Peter answered, the Christ of God, the one that God had promised to meet human need wherever it is, whatever it is, eternally. You are the Christ of God. We're going to sing uh, our next hymn, uh, Break Now the Bread of Life. <laughs>